What's going on, everybody? Lil Chris here, and I finally got another request to review another pool player's game. This player here is also named Chris and is also a software developer just like myself. Now, he contacted me and asked if it would be possible for me to review his playstyle and offer any type of advice I can give to help improve his game, particularly with regards to playing position and pattern play. So I asked him to record himself playing three games of 8-ball and to trade between solids and stripes whenever he misses so it'll actually be like he's playing a real game of 8-ball. Now, from what he's told me, he's only been playing pool for about a year and has never been part of any kind of league, so he doesn't have any type of rank or rating. So what I'm going to do is review this as an APA match, the Amateur Pool Player Association. So I will be trying to keep track of how many innings it takes for him to finish a rack. On top of that, I will try to point out any bad habits that I think he can work on to get rid of, as well as point out different types of pattern plays of what he could have done versus what he actually did do. And at the end of all of this, I'll give my opinion on what I think his APA rating could be for the game of 8-ball. Now do keep in mind that I'm just giving my opinions, and there very well could be other options that he could have done besides what I mentioned. So feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp of the shot and the other option that he could have done. Now let's begin. Okay, Chris, let's take a look at this first rack here. And the first thing I want to point out is I want you to watch your elbow here when you break. Look how high your elbow is as you're prepping up to do the break. But when you actually do break here, your elbow significantly drops. Not only does it significantly drops, it causes you to actually pick up your cue so much to where your bridge hand almost lifts off the table. Now, this is something that I mentioned in my previous coaching video where I just don't really advise that there should be any type of cue movement other than back and forth when you actually hit the cue ball. Because if you're moving the cue when you're striking the cue ball, when exactly are you doing it? Are you doing it before you hit the cue ball, during hitting the cue ball, or after you're hitting the cue ball? Now, if you're doing it after you hit the cue ball, there's not really that much of an issue. I just consider it bad form because it introduces the possibility of you being able to do it during contacting the cue ball or even before contacting the cue ball. Now, if you're moving your cue up and down pretty much as you're contacting the cue ball, then there's a high possibility that your cue can actually just miss cue right off of the cue ball, um, especially if the tip of the cue is not chalked. And the biggest thing that you can have a problem with is if you're moving your cue before you contact the cue ball, then you're probably going to hit the cue ball in an, area, in an area that you did not mean to. In other words, if you look at this cue ball diagram here, and if you're practicing up to hit the cue ball directly in the center and you're picking up your cue before you hit the cue ball, then more than likely you're possibly going to invoke some topspin on the cue ball, which you probably didn't want to do. You probably actually wanted to do a center ball hit. Now, I understand the purpose of the uh, extreme follow through there so that way you can try to drive power into your break. Perfectly fine and perfectly understandable. But consider that if you want to hit the cue ball hard, just try to work on it to where you're not having to drop your elbow to try to drive so much power into it. That way you can try to eliminate the possibility of your cue moving up and down whenever you strike the cue ball. Hopefully as we go through the rest of this video we won't really see that happening during your actual shooting when you're not really focused on hitting the ball hard you're more worried about hitting the ball with control so that way you can set up for your next shot the break shot in my opinion is not really that different from actual shooting during the course of the game even on the break you want to try to maintain some sort of control on the cue ball so that if you pocket a ball on the break you can continue to shoot so I suggest that you work on that and uh, see what we can do as far as being in more control and then try to pull in power without losing control. Now having said that, let's see what the rest of the break looks like. Because it looks like you made a stripe on the break. So the way I'm going to work this is that when you trade off to shoot solids, whenever you miss solids, that's when I'm going to increase the inning count and we're going to see how many innings it takes for you to finish this rack. Now, at this point, what I usually tell my APA teammates is that when you realize what set you are, or as let's say you didn't make anything on the break and you're trying to figure out what set you're going to claim, you want to be able to understand where are all the balls on the table. In this case here, with you being stripes, I would have to ask you, do you see anything on here to where there is something difficult for you to do with stripes? Because right now, 
I don't see anything. If I were solids, my biggest issue is going to be this clutter right here. But since we're starting with stripes, there isn't really any clutter. You're actually in a fairly good position to almost run the table provided that your cue ball execution and then of course your pattern play all matches up. Now, I'm not entirely sure what your skill level is. We'll figure that out once we get to the end of the video. So I will go ahead and suggest a possible route to finish the table here. Now, the one thing that we have is this lonely little 13 ball right here, while the rest of the stripes are down here at this end of the table. So one strategy that I usually try to suggest to people is finish the table off in sections. So in other words, since we have one ball at the top half of the table, let's try to get rid of it as soon as possible, because then that way all we have to do is maintain control at the bottom half of the table, which won't allow us to do any large cue ball movements. It should be relatively small cue ball movements. So if we know that, what should we do here? Well, considering where the cue ball is at, I'm certainly not suggesting that you try to shoot it now. I don't think that would be a good shot to do. What you can do, though, is shoot the 12 ball, I think this is the 12 ball, into the lower left corner pocket. Now, what is the cue ball naturally going to do if you don't invoke any side spin? It's going to come off and do something like this. And then depending upon how hard or soft you hit it, you can even keep going to where you start zigzagging all the way up the table. Now, this is not something that I'm suggesting. What I'm just showing here is for you to understand how the cue ball may actually react if you don't use any side spin. And that's, of course, if I have the angle correct. This recording angle uh, this recording angle that you did here I think is really good, uh, but I can't really be 100% accurate as to where the cue ball is going to go unless there's an actual complete aerial view um, on the uh, pool table. So one thing I can suggest here is we do want to shoot the 13 ball next after we shoot the 12 ball. So if this is the natural path that the cue ball is going to take, then we probably want to try to get it to do this and land right here. That way, all we have to do is just shoot the three, or sorry, the 13 ball into the corner pocket, and then we can halt the cue ball right after that without having to put any side spin. Because now we're completely done with that half of the table, and we only have to focus on this half here. So from here, the next shot that I could see is going to be this ball. I can't really tell that looks like the 10 ball to go into this pocket here. And the natural position takes the cue ball right here, setting you up for the nine ball which is what you're going to want to shoot next because the nine ball allows you to play position for this ball here. This looks like the 14 ball. And then from the 14 ball, if you were to stop the cue ball right here and then shoot the 15 ball all the way up here, we then follow the cue ball to get the cue ball to land right here to play the eight ball here into the corner pocket. That is one pattern play that I can currently see at this point in time. Now, if your skill level is only, let's say, um, a three or a four, what's going to happen here? Well, maybe you can't see that far ahead. So usually what happens is um, players will play one ball ahead. And what I'm betting is going to happen is you're going to still play this 12 ball here and then have it come over here like this and land for this ball here. But let's find that out. Let's see what we do. So I can already see that you're at least planning ahead. It looks like you're wanting to play this ball next. Uh, what is that? That looks like the, the 15 ball. So I already like the fact that you're planning ahead and trying to figure out what you're going to do. Now, how far have you planned ahead? Is this only a one ball plan ahead? And then you're going to figure out what to play after the 15 ball? That's perfectly fine, all depending upon skill levels. Higher level skill players usually can plan out an entire run out if they can actually see that. So when you shoot that, it looks like you're trying to play position, but it, it, you ended up falling a little short. So now you have no choice but to go for the 13 ball here. So you're going to most likely do something like this. And because of where the cue ball is at, I'm more than willing to bet that you're probably just going to cause the cue ball to roll up here, which is going to allow you to play position for this ball here. And see, good. You're going to look to see, and that's exactly what you're going to try to do. Let's see how your uh, let's see how your success is, and then you're planning a few more balls ahead after that. That's it. That's awesome. Now your your plan is fine, but what is your execution like? Those you know it, it, you can have a plan all you want, but if your execution isn't on par, then the plan doesn't really matter.
Good shot, good shot. Or at least, at least I can say good try. So now we're on solids. And so after you miss a solid shot here, then we're going to increase the inning count. So you check to see that you actually did get position on the 12 ball. So now the same question applies now that you're going to shoot solids. And that's to identify all of the bad spots on the table and then try to figure out how you're going to deal with them. Now you already heard me mention before that this whole clutter right here is bad. All right, what are we going to do with the four ball, the six ball? Um, I think that's the three ball and even the two ball because none of them really go. And I'm certainly not going to suggest that you do a three ball combination and try to pocket the two ball. Um, that's not very uh, strategical, uh, but it is cool if you pull it off because it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of being able to, to show off. Now, as far as planning, you do have the possibility of making the seven ball. It looks like even from this cue ball angle. And if you're successful at doing that, then the cue ball might come over and separate these. Now, what's really difficult to figure out is, well, if you're successful at doing that, where are they all going to go? Where's the six ball going to go? Where's the five ball going to go? Where's the four ball going to go? That takes time to develop. Now, one thing I can say, though, is I'm not suggesting that you shoot the seven ball now. I think you should actually shoot the one ball here into the corner pocket and then just stun the cue ball over here so that way you can get closer to the seven ball and then actually try to break out those solids. Until you do something like this, there's really not much more to plan for because we have to see what happens to the clutter after you make the seven if this is the route that you're going to take. Let's find out. So it looks like you're going to go ahead and size up for the seven and then try to break out that clutter. Okay, unsuccessful, but at least we're, um, we're on the same page as far as playing the seven was a good shot to play and then to try to get the breakout to go after that. So right now you have one inning on this rack. So now you're going to return back to stripes. So now that we're on stripes, there is still really no issue. Uh, where did the eight ball go? It looks like the eight ball is now up table. So the 13 ball right now serves to be a good last ball to shoot at because going from the 13 to the eight ball should be relatively easy. But the problem is going to be how do we get to the 13 ball and what was the last ball at this end of the table? That's going to allow you to do that. Um, offhand, it looks like you're going to possibly shoot the nine ball first here into this corner pocket. Uh, that's going to at least set you up for the, uh, is that the 15 ball, I believe? So it looks like you're going to trade corner pockets. You're going to go 15, 9, and then 14, which leaves the, I think this is the 12 ball or 10 ball. That This is going to be the last ball that you have to try to use to get position on the 13 ball. Let's see how all that works out. good chalking technique that you're actually brushing the chalk um, onto the tip and not actually like trying to screw the chalk onto the tip. Okay, good. It looks like you're still trying to plan. Actually, it looks like you're trying to plan a few balls ahead. That's actually really good. Now, one thing I'm going to suggest, though, is there's more than enough room here uh, between the cue ball and uh, the rail here for you to put your bridge actually onto the table. I don't necessarily suggest a long bridge, particularly if you don't have a straight stroke, which we haven't really determined yet. Uh, so we already talked about how you picked up your cue during your break. So you do have an up and down uh, motion that you have a problem that you need to fix. When you have long bridges like this, if your stroke is not straight, then you have the possibility of a side to side motion. So when you pull back and actually hit the cue ball, are you going to hit the cue ball in the center or are you going to hit it off to the left of center or are you going to hit it off to the right of center? And the shorter bridge length that you have uh, between your bridge hand and the cue ball, the less margin of error there is for that to actually happen. So what I'm suggesting is that your bridge length should be around six to eight inches from the cue ball. This here looks well over a foot. But it's not like it really matters. It's just, again, if you want to try to be consistent in how you do things, then that's how we want to shoot. Now look at this. Your, your bridge just looks like it's over two feet, maybe even two and a half feet. And if you look, 
it also looks like you didn't take any time. You got down, you shot the shot right there, bam, go, and you end up hitting it too hard because you don't want this position because you're trying to get position on the 15 ball. So one thing that I try to suggest to players is because this is very common is the amount of time that you spend on taking a shot is relative to the difficulty of the shot. Meaning that if the shot is easy, you end up spending less time preparing for the shot and you end up just shooting. And if the shot is hard, you end up spending more time trying to figure out how you're gonna hit it and everything else. And then of course, play position for the next ball. What I'm suggesting is eliminate the level of difficulty from the shot and treat every shot the same way and try to spend the same amount of time. Not always, not the same exact amount, but near the same amount of time. You know that you want to try to shoot this ball into this pocket and have the cue ball come off the rail and then land somewhere around this area here so that way you can shoot the 15 ball next into the corner pocket. At least that's what it looks like. Um, it would be ideal that your cue ball actually stops like right here, so you really wanted to hit the ball softly that way you can try to shoot the 15 ball like this and the cue ball will naturally come out like this. This would at least give you the chance to play that second to last ball to get position on the 13 ball that should allow you to get position on the uh, eight ball. So the advice here is take, try to take the same amount of time on each shot regardless of the level of difficulty the shot may be. So now since you can't shoot at the 15 ball, are you going to try to bank? What is that? I think it's the 10 ball. Are you going to try to bank the 10 ball? Or are you going to go, or are you now going to go up table uh, for the 13 ball? Okay, we're going to go up table. So if we're going to cut this ball in, then we should expect the cue ball to start working its way down here. Now, Trying to maintain control for the 10 ball, I think might be difficult. It actually looks like it was possible if you were successful at making the 13 ball because then you'd have to shoot the 10 ball, but then now you have to shoot the 15 ball and then get back up to the other end of the table. Uh, what, were we, what were we looking at the three ball for? From this position here, it looks like the only shots are Actually, let me erase this. The only shots are shooting the seven into the side, maybe shooting the 15, or sorry, shooting the five ball into the corner pocket, or even back cutting, I think this is the four ball into this pocket here. So I'm not sure what you were looking at uh, for the three ball, because it looks like you look to see if the three ball can go here. Um, are you planning on playing that now, or where in your plan are you allowing that to actually occur? Because if you don't even know what your first ball that you're going to shoot at, there's really no benefit to look at can the three ball go over here. Because as you shoot balls, you don't even know if you're going to run into the three ball and the three ball might uh, end up going into a different pocket. So right now, it doesn't look like there's really any issue on the table like I talked about before. Every ball at least has a path towards a pocket. The three ball has a path to go here. I can't really tell if the four ball can go, but let's just go ahead and say that it does. Uh, the two ball has a path here, six ball has a path here, five ball has a path here, and even the seven ball has a path. So I'm probably going to have to suggest that the one ball be the first ball. I think that's the easiest one on the table. And the natural position brings the cue ball back out to here towards the center of the table to where you can either attack the um, five ball or even the four ball. If you hit the uh, ball soft enough and the cue ball lands right here, then it's um, apparent that the four ball is going to be next. Now that part there, that's where I'm gonna stop because I wanna see what you're going to do. I don't wanna always give you a complete run out to the eight ball just to show you what other, what possible options are out there just to get you started and then we develop ourselves to the eight ball. Let's see what you do. Okay, you're checking to see if the seven ball goes into the uh, bottom right corner pocket. Is that gonna be the next ball you're gonna try to play if you choose the one ball? Because you are choosing the one ball. Now, one thing I'm going to say here, though, is the grip hand. It looks like you're uh, grabbing the very back end of the butt of the cue. This is something I see mostly happens with snooker players. So I don't know if you have maybe a snooker background or, or not, but I just wouldn't suggest that because long bridge or grabbing the butt of the cue from way back there is usually what causes long bridges to actually occur. So again, 
if you don't have a straight stroke and we want to try to shorten uh, the bridge length, it'll actually be easier for you to do that to actually grip the cue anywhere near the uh, linen grip. I think if your cue has a linen grip, um, so that way we can create a shorter uh, bridge length. Now, as far as your posturing, everything looks good here. I mean, the Q-tip is right next to the cue ball. You have a relatively a 90 degree angle um, from, from your shoulder to elbow to your grip hand. So that way you have a full range of motion to where you can actually swing the cue back and forward and actually have a good follow through. So the only thing I would suggest there is just changing where you're actually um, gripping the cue. Okay, so we missed the one. And it looks like we wanted to get position on the seven ball. But now we're going to be on inning two. So now we're back to stripes. So judging by where everything's at, it looks like you're going to have to shoot the 13 ball. Let's see what you do. Bit of a stretch. Okay, good shot. Sets you up uh, great for the, I, I keep, calling it the 10 or the 12. We're going to say it's the 10 ball. A little bit of a tap shot and couldn't tell. Um, did you just miss aim or did your cue ball roll off? Um, the, the lights kind of flickered uh, there, so it was really hard to tell. Uh, but we didn't really control the ball. It looks like you just tapped the ball to try to just roll the 10 ball into the corner pocket. Here, I think it would have been okay for you to hit the ball with some authority because right on contact, we would just want the cue ball to just stop right here. And then that gives us a good line to the uh, 15 ball to shoot into the corner pocket. Okay, so now we're back on solids and the only ball you can shoot at really looks like uh, the five ball and that's what you're doing. Five ball up into the upper left corner pocket. Good long shot. Nice little uh, forgiving uh, pocket that, uh, that you have there. Catching the rail um, at this particular angle, I wouldn't have expected it to go in. But now it looks like we have some options here. It looks like you have uh, maybe the one in the side pocket or the four or the three. Whoops. A little bit of a miscue there. So when was the when was the last time you chalked? Um, I haven't really been paying attention to that. But at least you were successful at making the ball. But right now, it doesn't look like you're chalking at all for the next shot. It looks like you're just getting ready to shoot again. So, so far, that was what? a th You're on a three-ball run. So this is looking pretty good. We shoot the six into the lower right corner pocket. That'll automatically get us position for the three-ball to go into the... Or did I say lower left? I meant lower right. Um, and then that gives us position for the three ball to go into the lower left. And then we try to use the one and the seven um, to get position on the um, eight ball. But again, if we look there, it doesn't look like you spent any time. You have your plan. You got down. You just shot. There weren't, any pra there weren't really any practice strokes. There was no preparation to the shot. So what I usually try to tell my players that I think the purpose of the practice strokes are, I always try to say, give me at least uh, three to four, sometimes two to three practice strokes. Because what you're doing is that you're mimicking how hard you're actually going to hit the ball. If you're going to hit it extremely soft, your practice strokes will be nice and slow. If you're going to hit it about medium, then your uh, practice strokes are going to be about medium. And if you know you're going to hit the ball hard, then you're probably going to have some fast practice strokes. Because all you're doing is telling your brain what you're about to do so that way your entire body is in sync with what you're actually uh, thinking about doing versus just getting down and just rapidly trying to execute whatever it is you want to do and your body's not even warmed up to actually do it. So that's my reasoning for saying try to have at least two to three, maybe even three to four practice strokes to make sure that your entire body is in sync with your mind on what it is you're trying to do. So we missed the six. It looks like we um, overcut it. I couldn't really tell. Did you hit the bottom rail? Let's look at it one more time. No, you overcut it. You just ended up uh, back cutting it. And that brings us up to inning three. So now we're back on stripes. You're checking to see what position did you get for the one ball. Was that the ball that you were actually planning on uh, making after the six ball, though? Here with the stripes, this is the only shot that you have. The natural path of the cue ball is going to go from one rail to the other and give you position on that ball. And it looks like that's what you're wanting, so good. 
Okay, never mind. We didn't. I thought we were going to get hooked behind the five ball, but we didn't. So now I'm expecting that you're going to shoot this ball. I think the natural path does something like this. So we want to make sure that we avoid the scratch. Um, are we using any draw or any side spin? I'm not entirely sure. It looks like you did this notion here. So I'm expecting you to hit that ball really hard if that's what you're going to do. That's what you tried to do. But one thing I am going to point out again is this right here. Picking your cue up off of your bridge hand when you shoot. So go back to what I said earlier. When exactly did you do this? Did you do it before, during, or after contact? Because this bad habit here, again, is going to cause differences in where you're hitting the cue ball. And it's possible that you didn't hit the cue ball exactly where you wanted it. So seeing that the cue ball is just doing this, it looks like you um, stunned the cue ball um, into your object ball, meaning that it had no side spin, or I'm sorry, it had no top spin or bottom spin. So it looks like you did a center ball hit. Was that what you were wanting to do? Or did you want the cue ball to actually go forward and hit the rail? And since you made this gesturing motion here to do this, that you'd have to actually hit the ball hard. And what did you do? Did you actually bring your cue down and then went up after contact? Not entirely sure. I don't. We don't have a fast enough camera here to slow down the frames per second to see what all the actual motion was. But then we can also see that your um, elbow actually did drop here. If we go back and look to see where it originally was, you can see how high it is here. And then when you actually hit the ball, that you end up dropping your elbow, causing it to do that. Now, fortunately, you can still see the eight ball. It's just you have this long shot that you have here. We're going to try to what? Cut it into the uh, left corner pocket. I don't think you're going to bank it. Yeah, and a good shot at that. Now, look at this stuff here. You can see it's already getting ready to prepare for the uh, second rack. Look how much time you're taking. You shot the ball. You stayed down. Your cue is still in your bridge hand. The shot isn't even over yet. And when you saw that you made it, now you actually stand up and finished your shot. Now, it didn't look like you really did any practice strokes. How many practice strokes did you do? One and fired. So I would suggest at least adding two more practice strokes to that and that take that entire routine there and just apply it to every single solitary shot. So right now for rack one, we're up to three innings. We're going to keep the inning count running throughout, the, throughout these three racks to see how many innings it takes for you to complete these entire racks. So for this first rack here, I thought it was pretty good. I saw that you were trying to plan ahead. I think there were at least one shot where you were planning way too far ahead um, and, and you didn't even have the first ball that you were going to shoot at. You were just looking to see where balls could possibly go. I wouldn't suggest having that type of plan unless you knew how you were going to get the cue ball to be in the position to play those balls in those pockets that you're planning on doing. But how can you have that plan when you don't even know what the first ball is that you're going to shoot at? So figure out what the first ball is going to be. Have an idea of where the cue ball naturally goes by itself, um, which it looks like you have, and then figure out what the next ball is going to be because that is what allows you to build a decent run. At least from that basic concept, I think you can actually get put together um, good two to three ball runs. And then to get further along than that, every now and again, you're going to have to invoke some type of spin, whether it's bottom spin, top spin, left spin, or right spin. But I always suggest to players that if you study where the cue ball naturally goes by itself by just doing center ball hits, that gives you a good foundation to figure out what type of spins you might need to have um, to get better position on the next ball. So that's all that I can think of for the first rack. So let's proceed on to the second rack. Okay, so here we are with rack two. Now with rack one, you started off as stripes because that's what you made on the break and I was increasing the inning count every time that you missed a salad. But you also finished the rack as stripes. So right now you're still the same player about to break. In other words, if you were to make a solid on this break, then every time that you missed a stripe, that's what increased the inning count. But let's see how this break goes. Okay, so you make a stripe again, so I'll be counting the innings every time that you miss a solid. Now, what I can say, though, is we can look at your elbow again, look where it starts on the break, and then look where it finishes after the break. 
Okay, you still have that significant drop, and since you're using an open hand bridge this time, it's much easier for the cue to be lifted off of your bridge hand when you break. So I'd only be curious as to did you actually hit the cue ball in the center, or did you accidentally hit it above center because you picked up your cue, possibly before you hit the cue ball. So I do recommend that you break with a closed hand bridge or use some type of rail bridge where your uh, bridge hand is actually placed on top of the cue. That way it can't go anywhere. It should only be able to go back and forth. Now, since you did make a stripe on the break, let's see what the rest of the break is going to look like. Okay, so right off the bat, we have this little issue right here. We're not entirely sure what we're going to be able to do with these two balls. It looks like that's the 15 ball and the 12 ball. So offhand, it looks like this is supposed to be the first ball that you have to shoot at. This is the 13 ball. You're at least observing the table. So that's always good. Most beginning players, they would immediately just jump down and just shoot at the first ball that they're supposed to shoot at without any uh, pre-planning. So I like the fact that you still do that. Now, I do start to think, though, that you're taking a little too long uh, in your pre-planning. Now, since you're playing, you know, you're playing yourself, uh, it's perfectly fine how long you take, but in an actual match-like environment, it should only take you roughly between 30 to 45 seconds, sometimes even quicker than that, um, before people start to complain that you're actually playing a little too slow. It should be pretty obvious that this is the ball that you're going to be shooting at. And so if we shoot this, we can almost estimate that the cue ball might do something like this, and more than likely will either set you up for some sort of combination, unless you happen to land in the window to where you can just shoot uh, this ball down here by itself. Okay, good shot. And it looks like you did land in the window. So I, I'm pretty sure you're going to shoot this ball here. You're not going to do the combination. If you shoot this ball here, I think this is the 10 ball. I think it's pretty natural that you can shoot it in and have the cue ball do something like this to set up for the 9 ball. And it looks like you're at least planning on that, so that's good. And if you have the angle, I'm not entirely sure how much uh, this, what is that, the 3 ball is in the way. If you have the correct angle, then maybe you might be able to get the cue ball to drive into the clutter and then hopefully open up your 12 and your 15 ball. But let's see how that works though, because if you don't get the right position, then it's just not gonna happen. Okay, good shot. Looks like you might have hit it a little uh, too hard there. So I don't recommend that you actually hit the ball softer. What you could have done there is what's called a drag shot, and that's where you actually put a little bit of bottom spin on the cue ball. So what happens is, is as the cue ball is traveling towards that 10 ball, it's spinning backwards. But at some point in time, because you didn't hit it hard enough, that backspin is actually going to die out. And what's going to happen is it's going to slide across the table for a brief moment and then slowly start to roll forward. And you actually want the cue ball to make contact with the 12 ball the moment it starts to roll forward because a lot of momentum will actually get taken off of the cue ball when that happens. And then more momentum gets taken off the cue ball once it makes contact with the 12 ball. And you possibly could have gotten better position for the 9 ball. Now with this though, what are you going to shoot next? I'm only guessing that gesture there was to do some sort of bank shot. Now it looks like you accidentally touched uh, the cue ball. In a private setting this is perfectly fine, but do you know that in a league type setting, um, then you would have committed a foul and your opponent would have ball in hand. Okay, so you do go for a bank shot on the 15 ball, but we were unsuccessful. And at least you, if you were successful, you could have gotten position on the 9 ball to go into the same pocket as well. So now here we are on solids, and we have the same exact issue of this clutter right here. You even have a clutter here. 
And what's your first ball going to be? I'm willing to bet it's going to be the seven ball. Probably something like this. You might get fortunate enough and break this ball uh, out here. Okay, unsuccessful. Did we get a little lucky? No. Okay, so that's going to be another inning count. You do have position on the three ball if you were successful at making the seven ball, but now we're back to stripes. So not a whole lot you can do here. It looks like the nine ball should be the ball that you should shoot at. Let's see here. This ball does pass through here. The question is, is what do we do with this guy? You can shoot the nine ball into the corner pocket. That'll automatically allow you to get position on this ball here for something like this if you don't lose control of the cue ball. And you hit that rather hard. What were you trying to do? Were you trying to get the cue ball to come back up here? So that way you can either do this or possibly this. Most of the time when I'm coaching uh, beginning level players, I don't really advise a whole lot of cue ball movement. I try to get them to rely more on the natural roll of the cue ball and where it can naturally go. Now that was kind of interesting there. Not the fact that you scratched, but the way the cue ball is jumping off of the rail there. That makes me kind of think that your rails might be a little too low. I don't expect the cue ball to jump off of the rail like that unless the rail is actually sitting lower than half of the cue ball. Um, and that's what's causing it to bounce up um, every time the ball actually hits the rail. Do, do the object balls actually do the same thing? I haven't been paying uh, close enough attention. But we missed that cut shot. So now we have ball in hand and we're on solid. So we can try to do whatever we want with ball in hand. We should know that this is an issue here. I think this is your four ball. And since we have ball in hand, we could put the cue ball here and shoot it and get it out of the way. But I don't recommend that. What I do recommend is what you're doing here with the three ball. You can get the three ball out of the way and get position for the four ball. Is that what you're going to do? No, it looks like you were trying to break the four ball out. So let's go back and look at that again because that wasn't necessary. Here, I would have recommended that you just place the cue ball a little bit over, shoot the three ball into the corner pocket, and then just allow your cue ball to just drift right over here because then you're just free to shoot the four ball into the upper left corner pocket. There's no reason to break the four ball out when you're able to get some sort of position that allows you to play it. So keep that in mind whenever you're trying to figure out what kind of pattern uh, that you're going to run. And also because it looks like since you were focusing more on possibly breaking the four ball out, I think that's what at least caused you to miss the three ball, which we're now on inning five. Okay, but we got the lower left corner pocket well guarded from stripes. So what do we do here? Do we bank this ball over here or do we bank this ball over here? Looks like we're going to do the bank shot. Not a bad attempt. Not a bad attempt. Back on solids now. Already looking at what I think you should be looking at. And that's just a simple combination. You want to do the combination in such a way to where the one ball actually replaces the three ball. And actually just sticks right here also. Because then it's just another ball that you can actually make right afterwards if you chose to. Now with the, the hand gesturing there, I'd only have to ask, what were you planning on doing? I don't think you really needed to hit the ball that hard. If we go back and look, all you have to do is just make the ball, right? So you can, you can hit the ball in the center and have the um, one ball come over here, replace the three ball and the three ball falls. Or your cue ball just does something like this and lands somewhere over here, again, depending upon how hard or soft that you hit it. And also that you just hit it with a center ball hit. The fact that the cue ball came back at you tells me that you might have put some right spin on the cue ball. And did you mean to do that? Because if not, that's clear proof that you have a side-to-side -side motion whenever you're trying to strike the cue ball, which is also because of the long bridge that you had that I mentioned previously. So you could have put your bridge hand a little bit closer, like over the, what is this, the four and the six ball and placed it right here. So that way your bridge length is a little bit shorter. And so the margin of error for you to go side to side 
to actually hit the cue ball is just less. You could still drift, but it just won't be as bad. Now, if this is what you were intending on doing, perfectly fine. But since I saw you make this gesture like this, what ball were you planning on playing position on next? Were you trying to break this apart, maybe? Because again, remember, you don't have to. The four ball has a clear path to go into this pocket, which you can use the seven ball if you wanted to, to get position on it. So what can we do from here? Is this a 2-1 combination that you're going to play? I believe this is the two ball. Looks like that's what you tried. Not a bad attempt. Now we're back on stripes. Pretty obvious here to shoot that ball. Are you going to just stop the cue ball? Oh, you actually got the cue ball to draw back a little bit. But it looks like you're starting to rush, and I'm kind of wondering if you're starting to be a little tilted now after making uh, one mistake after another. It's uh, commonly known as the snowball effect. The, the moment you miss a shot, your snowball is now created, and it's up to you to prevent the snowball from getting bigger and bigger because every time you make some sort of mistake, that's going to cause your snowball to get a little bit bigger and to the point to where you just start to lose your temper, and then your entire game just goes to crap uh, after that. So we're just in a practice session, so it's, it should be easier to maintain uh, control of your attitude or whatever, but usually in a competitive-like environment for like league and stuff, it's a little bit harder because you don't want to lose. Now you looked happy about that, so that looks like that's what you wanted to do. You got the breakout, so good job there. Are you going to shoot it next now that you got the breakout? And where are you going to shoot it, in the side pocket or into the upper left corner pocket? Oh, just a bit of an undercut there. Okay, now back on stripes. What are we going to do here? You're going for, I don't know what that is. That looks like the 12 ball maybe. Yes. And a good shot at that. Now, what I would recommend though, it's not that you did anything wrong. I'm just giving another alternative. I personally would have thought of shooting this guy here and just don't do anything with the cue ball and let it come naturally where it wants to go. If you want to try to bring the cue ball back, this is where you would have to use some sort of bottom right spin just to get the cue ball to come back like this after you make this ball here. I think that's the 14 ball. And the reason for that is because of where the eight ball is at, which looks like it's this guy right here. Now, the reason why I'm suggesting that, though, is because your next ball would be this ball, and then your next ball would be this ball to set up for the eight ball. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with what you did. It's just that now that you're going to come up here to shoot this ball, then you're going to come back down here. And I usually don't advise stuff like that to where you're just going to different sections of the table. If you're always having to trade one side of the table to another, you're basically doing one hard shot after another. And at some point in time, you're going to miss a hard shot, at least here. It's the same principle of if you make that stripe up there, you're done with the upper half of the table. So now you return back to the lower half of the table and your cue ball movement becomes smaller after that, which should be easier to control. So we are successful at making it, so that's good. It's always good that you at least made the ball that you were trying to make. So does that mean you're going to shoot this guy next? Cue ball can naturally do something like this to which you shoot this guy and then uh, try to get position on the eight ball. Whoops, looks like we overcut it. That's gonna cause us to go back to solids and now we have an issue here for both solids and stripes. Okay, good shot there. That means this guy's probably going to be the next ball. You shoot that in, and the cue ball should naturally do something like this, most likely getting you position for this ball here. It looks like you're putting topspin on the ball, but you overcut that one. So now we're back on stripes. And it looks like you're going to try to bank it. I'm not really suggesting any type of safety plays right now since you're basically kind of playing against yourself. Uh, but do keep safeties in mind. Uh, they're always beneficial to actually play. 
um, and also because you requested that we talk about position plays and pattern plays. Uh, but safeties are not to be ignored. There will be some times where you want to try to put the cue ball in a difficult position for your opponent, knowing that you're not going to make a ball on the current turn that you're at. Okay, so this looks okay here. Good shot. My only question, though, if we go back and look, I don't expect the cue ball to do that hard of a turn. I would have expected the cue ball to do something like this. Let's watch where it rolls again. And look how hard it actually turns to the right. Did you put right spin on the cue ball, meaning that you hit the cue ball to the right of center, and did you intend on doing that? Because uh, if not, again, that goes back to the flaw that I think that might be in your stroke with uh, not hitting the cue ball straight, or your, your cue is actually veering off to one side or the other. So unsuccessful with that cut there. Back on stripes now. It should be pretty apparent that you would want to shoot this guy first and then use this guy to set up for uh, your eight ball. So it looks like you're at least planning that. Okay, so it looks like you it looks like you planned your three ball run out. And then you shoot this guy in, and then what? You're just going to let it roll over here like this? Awesome. Right, so it looks like you have at least a decent idea of where the cue ball um, goes. Um, it looks like we have to improve uh, aiming accuracy. And that would be evidence of it right there. Um, but that just comes in practice. I mean, there's there's no there's no secret uh, to you know always making a ball. It also looks like you might have an issue with speed control. Um, it, sometimes it looks like your cue ball is not landing exactly where you want it to land. And good shot. So there we are there. Let's go back and look because it's already uh, proceeding on to rack three. So good shot. So this rack took seven innings, and now we're on a total of 10 innings here. So right now, if I had to guess, you're sitting somewhere between the mid three, possible high three, maybe somewhere near the APA skill level of four. Now, the, with APA eight ball, the ranks go from two to seven. Um, so right now, I kind of see that you're sitting somewhere between the, the three and the four range being uh, after going through two racks. And it looks like stripes won again. So you had stripes from the previous rack, and you had stripes again in this rack. So currently, the striped player would be up two to zero. And if you're brand new to APA, you will start off as a skill level three. And if you were up against another skill level three, you'd be playing a race to two, which the game would be over, and the striped player would be the winner. So right now, all of the comments that I said from the first rack basically carry over uh, into this second rack. You're dropping your elbow uh, when you break. Um, you, it look, I can't tell if you're meaning to use side spin or if you're accidentally putting side spin on the cue ball when we saw some of those shots where the cue ball actually reacted um, differently than I would have expected if you're just doing center ball hits. So, But still, overall... Pretty good. Um, I think, uh, again, the bridge length, though, is still something is uh, was a concern on this one because that's not knowing whether or not if you were still trying to hit the cue ball in the center or to the left or right of center, depending upon uh, the way you're trying to set up for your next shot. So with all that in mind, let's move on over to rack three. Okay, so for rack three, in the essence of saving some time, I'm only going to be looking at whatever set you happen to make first and then fast forward through whenever you're shooting at the other set. So let's see what happens on this break here. Okay, it looks like you make a stripe again. Almost made a solid, and that's it. So all we're going to do is focus on when you're shooting stripes, and whenever you start to shoot solids, we're still just going to fast forward through it. And any time that you miss solids, that's when we're still going to increase the inning. So I like that you acknowledged this ball here. It looks like you have determined that that is the hardest ball on the table right now, but you're in a position where you can shoot it. So more than likely, I'm going to bet that you're going to do this. That's going to cause your cue ball to run into this ball here. And as long as you don't hit it too hard, you should have shots here on any one of these stripes right here. So this looks like to be the first ball that you should be going for.
Okay, one last double check. That's always good to know. Okay, real quick before you shoot though, I am gonna point out, let's go back to here. Let's look at, again, look how far back your grip hand is. And so right now, you and this also allows you to have that long bridge that we're talking about, but now your elbow to shoulder, or your shoulder to elbow to hand um, angle is not really at a 90 degree. It's actually extended a little further back. So you don't really have the ability to perform a full on stroke to where you can actually backswing and then forward swing all the way through uh, with your follow through. And if your follow through is too long, that's still what's going to allow you to um, pick up your cue. That's why I suggest that you would want to be able to have your grip hand somewhere right around here because then that's going to at least create the angle that I'm talking about and then you have a full range of motion from this spot here to where you can backswing and then even forward swing uh, to have your follow through. Okay, so let's see how this shot worked out. I think you overcut it. Yeah, just a bit of an overcut. And like I said, the cue ball ran into what appears to be the two ball and then you had positional shots here, here, and here. Okay, so now since you're on solids, I'm just gonna go ahead and fast forward through this. Cause I'm only gonna focus on when you shoot stripes. Okay, we missed a solid there. So now we're back on inning 11. So what stripe do we have now? It looks like we have the 13 ball in the side pocket and we have, this is the 11 ball into the corner pocket. Uh, what are we shooting at? It looks like you're shooting the five in the side. You did. So it looks like you must've forgot to, to trade off uh, between the sets. So we're gonna still consider this to be that you're shooting solid. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fast forward through it. Okay, and then we missed there. So we're gonna go ahead and count that as another inning. <clears throat> so right now as stripes, I think everything looks okay except for that guy right there. Where exactly do you plan on making him? It looks like the 12 ball is safe to go in here. You have a shot to go here. You can even shoot this ball up here or this ball up here. You went for that ball, good shot. So the hand gesture there um, tells me that you do have an issue with speed control. So the, in a practice environment, the best thing I can tell you is just shoot every ball softly and get a good feel of where the cue ball will go with just a soft hit and then start to determine that, oh, knowing that if I hit the ball this hard, this is where it's going to end up and say to yourself, well, it's not going to be far enough. So you know to hit it a little bit harder. And then much like the opposite, if it goes too far, you know that you can maybe hit it softer just as long as the object ball makes its way to the pocket. So just like this ball, I would just try to tap it. The cue ball should just naturally do something like this and then just stop. And so you can see how far your cue ball is rolling. That should give you an indication of how hard you're actually hitting it. Because at least from this position here, you'd have a shot on the 13 ball here in the side pocket. Okay, now we're back on solid, so let's just fast forward. Miss that one there. So, what do you got left here? Is it this ball here to go here? Yep. Good shot. Not much you can do with this here. You could try to cut this ball like this. I only expect your cue ball to just do something like this, slowly work its way or zigzag its way back up the table, depending upon how hard or how soft you hit it. Uh, you can also shoot this guy into the side pocket. Your cue ball is naturally coming out like this. And because it's naturally going out in that direction, you should have an idea that maybe you can get it to stop right here. That way you can shoot this guy into this pocket here. And I just saw you gesture a three rail motion there. So does that mean you're trying to come? It looks like you're trying to come right here. Right through there. You put your hands up like, yeah, maybe you didn't hit it hard enough. So that's where you can say to yourself, well, if you knew that this is where the ball was going to go, it probably would have been easier for you to try to stop somewhere right here so that you can shoot this ball here instead. But it looks like you're gonna try to cut it into the corner pocket and we have an undercut. So now let's fast forward through solids. Let's 
Solids is looking good. Whoops, never mind. <laughs> so not much you can do here for stripes. It looks like you're going to bank the ball. That's about what I can see here. And that was a good try. That was a really good try. Okay, so here, I understand why you would want to shoot this guy here. And the cue ball is probably going to do something like this to where you can shoot this guy next. But considering what I've seen you do as far as shooting, I don't think I would choose this guy. I think I would go ahead and choose this guy right here. He's just a sitting duck. You just tap the ball in, and the cue ball doesn't even really go anywhere. It goes right here. And that makes this shot now easier to do. And then from here, I think the cue ball would naturally just do something like this to give you a shot here. Now, there's nothing wrong with choosing this shot, but I think we can both agree that the side pocket shot is much easier than this cut shot that you're going to do for the corner pocket. That's the biggest reason why I would suggest it. It also allows you to have an easier way to control getting position onto another ball. Let's see how this works, though. And it looks like you undercut the ball. But like I said, you, sh you do the right thing because you have position on this next ball here, and then from here you'd have to go to the 11 ball. Okay, now the 11 is tied up with the one ball. So now you're going to be uh, going towards the side pocket. We know that, and you're automatically going to get position for this guy up here. The question is, is what would you be able to do with the 11 ball down here? Whoops. Oh, a little lucky. <laughs> That's all part of APA as well. You'd still consider to shoot under the APA rules because you don't have to call your pockets. Good kick shot. That was really good. Actually, uh, unfortunately, though, I think it's still a foul. Let me double check. Yeah, unfortunately, that's still a foul. After the cue ball hit the rail, it made contact with your ball. Neither that ball or the one ball or just another ball in general made contact with the rail. So your opponent would have ball in hand. You did miss that uh, solid there. We're on inning 17, but stripes again. You won stripes on the, the last two racks, and you're shooting the eight ball now. And you were successful. Good shot. So we have a total of 17 innings here. So I think that should be pretty well and clear, at least to me, in my opinion, that you are settled in as a skill level three. So with all the things that I've mentioned throughout the entire game here, you have an issue with dropping your elbow when you break. Fixing your grip hand and changing where you're actually gripping the cue will help with that because you don't have to worry about following through so much when you are actually gripping the cue closer up, at least where the linen grip uh, would be. Fixing your grip hand would also allow you to fix your bridge length which again, I'm not entirely sure what your knowledge is on using side spin. A lot of the shots didn't really look like you were trying to use side spin on them, and then maybe some of them you were. So on some of the shots where it feels like you're not using side spin, but because of the reaction of the cue ball, I think you did put side spin, which tells me you might have a side to side motion when you're actually trying to hit the cue ball in the center. And that would be with because of that long bridge. And if, the main reason is because you don't have a straight stroke. So practicing keeping your stroke perfectly still from going uh, and only going back and forward and not side to side would be good for you to practice. You have a good notion on trying to plan, but always at least try to start your plan from the ball that you plan on shooting at first, at least identifying um, where you're going to start. You also at least have an idea of knowing where trouble spots are and how to deal with them. So those are all really good. So as long as you keep practicing on those things, I think um, you will be able to um, improve as time goes by, like everybody else does when you practice. You do have an issue with speed control. So that's why I recommend to start by just shooting softly. You know, If you can't shoot the ball softly and make it, then there's no way you're really going to be able to do things at a faster pace. So start off doing slow, and then of course learn where the cue ball goes at that slow space slow pace and then gradually increase um, as you need to when you identify that you know that the cue ball is not going to roll far enough. 
or actually hit the ball softer if you know that you can still make the object ball and then you don't have the cue ball roll too far away. So I hope this was all helpful and that you're able to learn from this. So I do appreciate you providing me the footage and giving me the opportunity to actually review your game. Now for everybody else, um, I would like some advice maybe on what to do with other types of reviews. I do believe this video is probably going to be um, on the edge of being over an hour. So I don't expect a whole lot of people to actually sit through this and actually watch it, except of course for Chris himself because he requested it. So right now I'm kind of thinking maybe I ought to be able to just study two racks of play under the same game style, unless of course there's an opponent that I might be able to review at the same time. So feel free to leave me some suggestions and of course feel free to leave some comments for Chris himself with the timestamp of whatever shot he's taking with um, another option that he could have done. So if anything, I hope you all were able to enjoy this video. If so, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Take care, everybody.